the heart should not be beating if you are going to repair a valve or close a abnormal communication like an ASP or ESP. The surgeons prefer to have a standstill heart. They don't want to. Whereas the bypass grafting, coronary artery bypass grafting nowadays mostly done with the beating heart or off pump procedure. But uh, intracardiac procedures still require a cardiopulmonary bypass. So that is the reason why they have to have a, a basic idea about how this is done. So it incorporates an extracorporeal circuit to provide physiological support. Each venous blood is drained into a reservoir. It is oxygenated because the lungs are not functioning and sent back to the body using a pump. This is a very simple method of explaining what is a cardiopulmonary bypass. To understand that, one should know the components of the CPG circuit, including the cardiopulmonary system before we talk about the conduct of uh, CPG circuit. It includes pumps, cannula, tubing, reservoir, oximeter, heat exchanger, arterial line filter, all these things are the components are the biggest uh, that that is required. And uh, the modern machines I have got the uh, monitoring pressures, uh, facility for monitoring pressure, temperature, Saturation, saturation, hemoglobin, blood gas, electrolytes, uh, bubble, uh, air bubble detector, or reservoir level detector, all the alarms also incorporated, just like your newer uh, PCR workstations. Compared to the older day pumps, uh, the CPG machines, they have incorporated a lot of alarms so that can detect what exactly is the defect that is happening. And uh, this is the basic circuit. We, we drain the venous blood from the heart into a reservoir. Then it is comes to, to the heat exchanger to a oxygenator, oxygenated, and then the blood is returned back to the aorta for, to supply to the entire other parts of the body. So the venous drainage happens by gravity, as mentioned, and then the whole thing is oxygenated and then circulated. So when there is no blood flowing through the heart and lungs, the heart after some time, along with the cardioplegia, stops heating. It is going into what is called the diastolic arrest. It is made to stop artificially. <clears throat> then the surgery time, they, they are able to do the whole surgery in a standstill heart. And, uh, Revive it later on. So the, this is the line drawing, which is a simple circuit that you have to know. And this is the actual color drawing where you can see the venous drain occurs from the SPC and uh, EVC, and then goes to the reservoir. Then from there it is pumped to the oxygenator where there is a heat exchanger attached. And then it is uh, once oxygenation is adequate, carbon dioxide is removed by the flow. Oxygenation is by the uh, oxygen that is supplied to the oxygenator, whereas uh, you need to remove the carbon dioxide also, which is determined by the flow of this uh, blood through the oxygenator. Then, once it is oxygenated, it is again come back into the iota for supply to the entire systemic circulation in the body. Now, first we need the cannula to drain all this blood. So I would say that this is the first uh, equipment that is required before you talk about the pump. So the cannula, uh, they connect the patient to the CPG machine. That way they are very important. They are made of PVC and are wire reinforced to prevent obstruction or kinking. Just like you are uh, uh, reinforced or armored electrical tube, this PVC tube is also Wire reinforced so that it won't sink or occlude completely. And uh, there are two types of cannula venous cannula and arterial cannula. The venous cannula, they are 12 mm in size, that is the largest, that is half an inch size. And uh, single stage cannula are used during most open heart surgeries, where two cannula are inserted into the superior and inferior vena cava and joined by a white piece. 
and uh, there is a dual stage cannula also for most talk procedure where a single cannula is inserted into the directly into the right atrium so this is the example of a bicaval or a uh, single stage cannula where it goes into the cc and iec and then connected with the yt and you can see there is a, this is called the snare they will close and the clue this so that there is no uh, uh, clipping of this cannula should not take place so they always put a snare and then tighten it over here and this is a single atrial which is called the cavo atrial cannula which goes to the right atrium to the ivc which also can be used and the ftc blood will drain into the right atrium and then go through that so this is a single atrial and bicaval cannulation there are two methods and uh, drainage occurs passively by gravity relying on the difference in the height between the patient and the reservoir sometimes you can apply vacuum if the tubings are smaller or the reservoir <coughs> cannula and tubings are smaller you can apply vacuum to drain the blood the alternate site for cannulation in some cases by a femoral vein or uh, uh, through the <coughs> p2 surgery that is the patient earlier having a uh, sternotomy and open heart surgery the valve is misfunctioning or it become loose and then they want to do a redo valve replacement for all those surgeries femoral vein is preferred rather than going into the Uh, already cannulated vessel, and there is a vent required to drain the left side of the heart for uh, draining the blood through the bronchial and tracheal veins. So that is also another vent that is there, and there is a cardioplegic uh, drain also which is inserted around the pericardium. And the arterial cannula, it is about eight mm in size, so three to eight inches, and the arterial cannula is usually inserted into the ascending aorta. The alternate sites are femoral, innominate, and axillary. Where again, a redo surgery or minimally invasive surgery, you can choose the alternate sites rather than other alternative also. Now, the from the once the cannula is inserted into the venous uh, site, it has to drain into the reservoir. They collect the blood drained from the heart. Open reservoirs are more commonly used. They allow passive removal of the drained venous air. Along with the option of applying vacuum, also they integrate a separate cardiotomy and defoaming circuit to process the suction blood. Also, and when they are used, a safe level of blood in the reservoir is maintained to avoid any air entry to the arterial circuit. It's very very important to prevent air uh, going into the systemic circulation, producing a systemic air embolism. So the, we have to be very careful. Not to allow any air to mix with the blood that is circulating outside the heart. And closed reservoirs have limited volume capacity, but offer a smaller area of blood contact with artificial surfaces. And the contact with the artificial surface is supposed to be the main reason for the inflammatory reaction that is happening in the cardiopulmonary bypass. That is why nowadays uh, they have switched over from. Uh, usage of CPV for coronary revascularization to beating heart. That is the main reason. That all the ill effects of uh, going into the CPV machine and that inflammatory response is completely avoided by doing it in a off-pump method. Uh, however, <clears throat> they may require a separate circuit for processing the suction blood. So there are three types of uh, suction. The reservoirs. This is called the open group reservoir. This is a non-suction group, and this is a closed group. So that is reservoir. This is the actual picture of a reservoir, which you can see with the, all the markings where you can get the blood collected here. You know how much volume is there in that. Now, from the reservoir, blood has to be pumped into the oximeter. So the roller pumps has got two rollers positioned in a rotating arm, which compress the length of the tubing to produce the forward flow. And of course, centrifugal pump is not very commonly used. Most hospitals, to my knowledge, use only roller pump. 
and when rotated rapidly the centrifugal pump creates a negative pressure at one inlet and the positive pressure at the other end thus propelling the blood forward so this is the difference between this is the upper one is the low uh, roller pump so where the, the roller crushes or compresses the tubing to have a forward flow whereas uh, in the centrifugal pump there is a negative pressure created so that Uh, the blood is uh, flowing automatically, so uh, less trauma is there in centrifugal pump. Whereas uh, this is likely to have a little more trauma because it is being compressed. And uh, this is the comparison between the two. And uh, uh, the centrifugal pump more main disadvantage is it is after load dependent, whereas uh, the roller pump is uh, after load independent. And no flow meter required, whereas here you need a flow meter. And the blood trauma and the tubing debris are more here, whereas they are much less here. No back flow, whereas here you can get a retrograde flow possible. Roller pump is cost-wise much cheaper, whereas centrifugal pump is expensive. And uh, roller pump you can use it for short-term use and it's bulky. Whereas uh, this centrifugal can be used for long term and it is portable also. And uh, circuit description from excessive line pressure. And uh, there is no disruption here in centrifugal. Uh, greater risk of air embolism in roller pump, whereas lesser risk in centrifugal pump. And uh, the priming volume is much less in roller pump, whereas priming volume is more in centrifugal pump. Now coming to the oximeter. So once the blood has been drained into the reservoir, it is pumped through the pump to the oximeter. And of course, nowadays we use only membrane oximeter, which has hollow microporous polypropylene fibers, 100 to 200 micron internal diameter. And blood flows outside the fiber while gases pass inside the fiber, thus separating blood gas. So the oximeter, that's the Function of your lung. So, main oxygenation and removal of carbon dioxide is done at the oxygenator level. So, they have less propensity for air embolism and give greater accuracy in blood gas control. The newer designs have an integral filter to manage emboli, thus making additional serial filters unnecessary. The heat exchanger is integrated with all oxygenator and placed proximal to it to reduce the release of. Uh, Uh, the alterations in the temperature of the saturated blood. So this is the picture where you can see this is the gas inlet, uh, this is the gas outlet also. And this is the manifold. The blood comes through that. Lot of uh, micropore polypropylene mm -hmm. fibers are here. So this is a hollow fiber bundle. And uh, so once the blood uh, uh, is sent in, so the gas goes in one direction, the blood goes in the opposite direction. So this is the gas inlet you can see, that's the gas outlet, whereas blood comes in the opposite direction and then goes out in the blood, so that it's yet oximeter. This is the picture of that oximeter with the heat exchanger. Now these tubings which are connecting all this uh, uh, oxygenator to pump and all these things, they are made up of PVC with uh, good durability. And, uh, they have some plasticizers to adapt to flexibility. And, uh, they are potentially toxic and known to leach from the tubing. So they have new plasticizers like the diophyll adipate, which has got less leaching and the was not uh, completely into the market and approved. Now, the cardioplegia system is a very important thing for uh, protecting the heart during the transfer in the cross plank and the surgery. So, it renders uh, the heart is totally ischemic. Cardioplegia is the one which protects that. So, it's a method of myocardial protection where the heart is perfused with the solution. Causing electromechanical arrest with the reduced myocardial oxygen consumption. And the cardioplegia cannula can be inserted in uh, two methods. Uh, it can be either the 
the grade or it can be with the grade and the separate pump delivers the cardioplegia either anti grade or retrograde retrograde uh, cardioplegia alone results in inadequate right ventricular protection so cardioplegia can be systolic or blood based warm or cold and can be given continuously or intermittently so cardioplegia is itself a short form question in your theory paper so you must be able to write all the details about what are the methods how they are given what is its role what is composition all that you have to do it's a short form question that is frequently asked mostly they are potassium based solutions the blood cardioplegia is a combination of oxygenated blood the crystalloid in a ratio of either 1 is to 1 or 8 is to 1 this is mostly for uh, pediatric patients and substances such as bicarbonate mannitol magnesium calcium adenosine cocaine glucose and glutamate are also added to protect the myocardium so if you see this picture many times you will be hearing what is called aortic cross clamping so the aortic cross clamping is done proximal to the aortic uh, cannulation so the uh, blood which is going to supply the blood to the entire body is inserted that cannula is inserted distant to the aortic clamp whereas the cardioplegia cannula has to be inserted proximal the close to the aortic valve uh, before the aortic cross clamp and they can have this is the uh, cardioplegia cannula which is inserted goes through the coronary ostium and then it is the anti grade whereas if you want to do it in the retrograde you can have to go through the atrium go to the uh, coronary sinus and then insert and then give it in the back uh, the rear fascia retrograde fascia so other circuit components are gas line blender which delivers fresh gas to the oxygenator in a controlled mixture and the fio2 determines the arterial oxygen tension whereas the flow of blood through the oxygenator determines the pseo2 on the bypass this is a very important point you have to remember and the arterial line filter is present distal to the pump and removes particulate matter more than 20 to 40 micron in size you must want to first uh, do the conduct of ctd you have to do a priming priming helps in deairing the entire ctd circuit by, by uh, consisting of a mixture of crystalloids and other things what i told earlier priming causes hemo dilution which improves flow during hypothermia and heparin 3 to 4 units per ml is added to the prime itself so apart from the systemic circulation we have to add uh, heparin also it is uh, to give heparin before the uh, cannulation of the major vessels but uh, priming solution also we add 3 to 4 units per ml for uh, to the prime solution and depending upon the pre bypass hemoglobin and priming volume additional external blood may be uh, targeted to for the hematocrit from 21% Twenty-four percent in adults and twenty-eight to thirty percent in children. Now you have to know what is the total circulating volume. Patient's blood volume plus priming volume will be the total circulating volume. And uh, target hemoglobin on CTB we have to calculate using patient's blood volume multiplied by hematocrit divided by total circulating volume. So if you use this formula, you will know what is the target hematocrit on CTB. and what is the blood required on prime you can calculate using this formula what is the target hematocrit multiplied by total circulating volume minus patient hematocrit into patient blood volume divided by the hematocrit of donor blood which is your blood rate so cardiac index of a 70 kg adult is, uh, with a normal metabolism at 37 degrees centigrade is 2.2 to 2.4 liter per meter square per minute so this is the cardiac index and for each 1 degree decrease in temperature the required cardiac index reduces by 7% and the pump flow can be reduced by an equivalent factor 
and the required pump flow can be calculated as follows pump flow is equal to body surface area into cardiac index and uh, how do you calculate the body surface area that is meter square is square root of height multiplied by weight divided by 3600 so you have to have the height in centimeters you multiply it with the weight in kilogram divide that by 3600 the resulting answer you have to find out the square root of that and you will get the body surface area now initiation of uh, cpb you have to have first heparin 300 units iv administered before arterial cannulation with a target of act that is activated clotting time assured after 3 minutes so you have to wait for 3 minutes after giving heparin and it should be more than 480 seconds That is uh, normal is about uh, 80 to 120. So we wait for at least three to four times uh, prolongation. And during arterial cannulation, the systolic pressure should be 90 to 100 to reduce the risk of aortic dissection. And the aortic cannulation is done first to provide volume resuscitation in case of hypotension associated with venous cannulation. And once the aortic cannula is connected to the tubing. line pressure is checked to rule out dissection and after venous cannulation venous clamp is gradually released to establish full cpb then ventilation is discontinued now anticoagulation activated clotting time is the point of care test used to assess the adequacy of hepatization so normal range is 80 to 120 it can be affected by hemodilation and hypothermia So act must be monitored every 30 to 40 minutes during bypass. If it falls below 480, it give extra 500 units of heparin. And uh, when the act is greater than 300 seconds, it is safe for cannulation. And uh, when it is more than 400, it is safe for going on bypass. So it is not necessary that we always wait for 480. And uh, act 480 is safe for even going for deep hypothermic cardiac arrest. And the heparin resistance is suspected. Most common cause is antithrombin 3 deficiency. So after discussing with the surgeon, total of 600 units of heparin per kg, if it does not achieve an ACP value of more than 480, then you can give recombinant antithrombin 3 concentrate should be considered. or sometimes you can give fresh frozen plasma also to increase the antithrombin 3 level this is only if they suspect apparent resistance now what are the how are you going to give anesthesia and the monitor the patient when he has gone on bypass the perfusion pressure is used as a surrogate marker of organ perfusion and should be maintained between 50 and 70 mm of mercury hypertensive patient should have a little higher uh, values so that they don't go in for any stroke problem cerebral oximetry have of potentials and transcranial doppler are used to assess the adequacy of cerebral blood flow and mixer venous oxygen saturation monitoring can provide an estimate of the balance between the global oxygen delivery and demand of the, the cerebral issues and mixed venous oximetry of 70% or greater is maintained but even this does not guarantee adequate perfusion of all tissue bed blood level in the reservoir should be monitored to prevent air embolism and central venous pressure should be low high cep indicates a poor venous return so here cep must also be measured routinely and monitoring of aortic line pressure blood temperature and integrity of gas supply to the oximeter is essential glucose is maintained between 120 and 180 mg for all people whether they are diabetic or non diabetic and anesthesia can be maintained by inhalation route or total intravenous anesthesia can be given and volatile anesthetic provide cardio protective effects through pre conditioning so some people prefer to use that nitrous oxide is avoided because it can increase the air embolism if anything happens the anesthetic requirements are reduced with hypothermia and drug pharmacokinetics are also 
altered due to hemodilution and altered metabolism now temperature management hypothermia is frequently used when you do a cardiac pulmonary bypass and the intra cardiac procedures because it has a organ protective effect and blood viscosity increases with hypothermia and allows maintenance of higher perfusion pressure despite hemodilution however hypothermia reversibly inhibits the clotting factors and platelets so it can cause more bleeding for temperature monitoring sites include the rectum urinary bladder esophagus pulmonary artericulture but nasopharyngeal temperature gives an estimate of cerebral temperature so you can put a nasopharyngeal probe also now coming to acid base management we mentioned about two types of uh, acid base measurement Uh, this is particularly important when you go in for hypothermia and reduce the patient temperature so what happens with cooling carbon dioxide becomes more soluble in the blood and the partial pressure decreases causing alkalosis so there is an alpha stat method which refers to the alpha imidazole ring of histidine in the hemoglobin which is an important intracellular buffer so the con constancy of the charge state of this ring is important in the regulation of pH dependent cellular process and in alpha state pH is not corrected and PaCO2 is allowed to fall with hypothermia and blood gases measured at 37 degrees are uncorrected in alpha state method and the alpha state maintains limits mic uh, microemboli may maintain cerebral auto regulation and in in homogeneous cerebral cooling is the disadvantages disadvantage in alpha stat management whereas in the ph stat maintains the constant ph and pco2 pso2 with hypothermia co2 is added to the oxygenator causing increased cerebral flow and cooling so prolonged ph stat management can lead to severe acidosis because you are adding carbon dioxide Uh, so it will be like a COPD case where uh, prolonged CO2 retention or increased level will cause acidosis. So switch to conventional alpha stat during the rewarming phase is required. In adults with moderate hypothermia, alpha stat is beneficial. In infants, brain injury is more associated with hypoperfusion, so CO2 stat is more useful in children. and if uh, deep hypothermic cardiac arrest is used a crossover strategy can be employed where pH stat in the initial phase of cooling followed by switching over to alpha stat can be done this maximizes cerebral cooling and avoids severe acidosis with prolonged pH stat and confirming suitability for weaning after all the procedure has been done Before dismantling the circuit, the surgeon must confirm that the heart and lungs are ready to resume their function. Two no's are important. No condition include a graft failure, valve leakage or dissection, and no residual air in the heart. So these two, that is whatever repair has been done, has been done pata, and there is no residual air. And uh, two satisfactory things are satisfactory pacing and satisfactory ventilation and two physiological factors are physiological temperature 35 to 37 degree and physiological gases abg potassium and cao2 and the weaning weaning is the process where extra corporeal support is gradually withdrawn as the heart takes over the circulation the use of hypothermia requires a period of rewarming the high gradient between core and peripheral temperature can lead to after drop in temperature and supplemental dose of anesthetics are administered at the time of weaning acid base balance electrolytes or uh, oxygen level co2 level sugar hematocrit are within normal limit serum potassium should be maintained within normal level to a arrhythmia now after open heart procedures deairing of the heart is done and the, the transesophageal electrocardiogram is a useful aid to assist this 
air embolism frequently involving the right coronary artery due to its uh, <coughs> anterior location can cause elevation in the enzymes and myocardial dysfunction. It is treated by increasing the perfusion pressure and maintaining a pulsatile perfusion by partially closing the line. And uh, this CVT mnemonic we mentioned about uh, how to, uh, what are all the points to check before weaning from bypass. So C has got six items, cold, conduction, calcium, cardiac output, cells, and coagulation. E has got four, ventilation, vaporization, volume expansion, and visualization. And T has predictors, protamin, pressure, pressure, spacer, and potassium. So uh, the, the visualization and predictors are the two things which may be a little confusing. So I will just expand that. And this is another mnemonic to remember. What are all the steps in uh, weaning in three varicates? And uh, what is the visualization you have to do this day? Uh, contractility must be visualized. How the heart is contracting. How it is distended with the blood whether it is getting adequately ballooned up or over ballooned up or collapsing. Residual air, if you are able to find out any residual air, whether the conduction is from atria to ventricle or it is fibrillating or whether it is irregularly contracting. And valvular function, all these things have to be visualized. Coming to the predictors and factors contributing to adverse cardiac vascular outcome, preoperative ejection fraction, if it is less than 43% or diastolic dysfunction is there, that patient may have little difficulty in weaning. Our renal disease patients or female patients undergoing CABG with the cardiopulmonary bypass, elderly patients, congestive heart failure patients, emergency surgery, prolonged CPB of more than three hours, and inadequate operation, uh, all these things can lead to uh, difficulty in weaning. And incomplete myocardial preservation during cross clamping will result in ECG not in asystole and prolong the ventricular fibrillation before cross clamping, warm myocardium and the cascade of CPB pathology is why the CPB produces inflammatory response. You have to remember that. And blood interacts with non-endothelial surfaces of CPB, high plasma proteins are activated. Contact activation, extrinsic pathway, intrinsic pathway, cytokines, and complement activation. And five cellular systems are activated neutrophils, monocytes, endothelial cells, platelets, and lymphocytes. And five principal pathophysiological effects are happening bleeding, or thrombosis, or vasodilatation, capillary leakage, and susceptibility to infection. And five organs which can be affected are cardiovascular hematologic, pulmonary, renal, and neurologic. So these are the all five, five things, the rule of five you can remember. So whenever your blood is uh, flowing through artificial surface and non-endothelial surface, these are all the reactions that you have to think of. So five plasma proteins, five cellular systems activate to lead five principal effects on five cardinal systems. Now, I thought I will give a pictorial description of how you start uh, from the induction of anesthesia to induce the patient. First thing you induce, intubate and uh, start ventilating like a routine case when you take up a patient for CPB. And uh, once the patient is under, usually we first put in an arterial line. This is the first step in monitoring. Then you introduce a central venous line. Then you do a Sternotomy. Midline sternotomy is done. This is the most uh, stimulating period of the surgery. Once the sternotomy is done, retractors are applied to the sternum and the heart is exposed and pericardium is inside. Now, before introducing your arterial cannula and venous cannula, you have to apparnize the patient. So, you give 300 units of apparin, as I told earlier. And you measure the activated clotting time using this machine. This is the point of care testing. If you do after three minutes, you can do. 
and achieve the value is displayed like this. These are all the switches where you select it and then put it into the machine. And you will get a printout also if you have to attach it or document it in your pay sheet. And uh, uh, so after the opening, you have start introducing all the lines, arterial lines, uh, PC line, and all that, and start draining the blood into the reservoir. And uh, from the reservoir is brought through the pump to the oxygenator. So this is the next step that goes. And once the uh, oxygenation is done, uh, surgery is completed. And you can see the surgeon is trying to restart the heart at the end of the procedure by the internal paddles using the defibrillator. And uh, once the satisfactory completion is done, as we said, you have to reverse it with the protamine. That is done just before uh, removing the arterial cannula. First, venous cannula is uh, removed after adequately filling the heart, and then the arterial cannula is the last one to be so off. And uh, so, protein can be given, and uh, the heart is uh, the sternum is closed using the wires. So, the sternotomy is closed with the uh, metal wires, and then the skin is closed. So, that completes all the uh, steps in the management of uh, a pulmonary bypass. Okay.